and welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. It's my honor today to have Bob Vanderplatz all the way from Iowa on the podcast. Bob, how are you today? I'm very blessed, Josh. Thanks for having me on. And if you don't know Bob, Bob's the president and CEO of The Family Leader, a focus on the family affiliated ministry there in Iowa. Um, his leadership and voice of the family is frequently noted. His comments are widely requested in a number of different publications, such as Wall Street Journal, Fox News. And if you follow American politics, all I probably have to say is Iowa. <laughs> and you know <laughs> why that is the case. But I've come to respect Bob's leadership, um, his gospel-centered, kind of church-led vision for renewing the American experiment. And he's the source for the Daniel Initiative here in the state of Indiana. And so I've been looking forward to a conversation with him. I want to catch that vision that he shared uh, to a group recently and a number of pastors around the United States and get it out to our audience. So Bob, for those that may not know you and the family leader, would you give us just a brief background and your position there at the family leader? You bet. Well, the family leader, we're just thrilled to be a peer of the Indi Indiana Family Policy Institute. And um, so Josh does what our Greg Baker does. I do what your Ryan McCann does. And typically, Josh, what I say is we're the institution of the church, the family, and government, where they intersect. That's where we play. Hmm. And hopefully we're found by leading with the gospel and where we truly want to inspire the bride of Christ, the church, to engage the institution of government and hopefully it's for the advancement of God's kingdom, not just for the advancement of a political candidate or a party. I love even the way that you framed that as, as the mission of the family leader. I know a number of pastors that I run into, they think politics, ooh, dirty, you know, my public witness is going to be co-opted. Um, and so just hearing that as that's the stated mission of the organization, and I know it's carried out in the public square. I'm always interested in... The, the people that interview, their call into public life. And I often bring up this question because many times pastors will describe that call into the pulpit, but I'm convinced that many Christians are called into business, but also into the public square. So how did God lead you into ministry in this particular space? Well, that's a great question because it's not one that I'd planned on. It's not one that I designed. Uh, I was a teacher, a coach, a basketball coach, a high school principal, uh, I thought I'd be in education the rest of my life. Uh, education was kind of my Linus with his blanket. So education was my blanket, never wanted to leave it behind. Uh, but then Darla and I were gifted, and I say gifted with our third son, Lucas, uh, who was you know, born with unique abilities or significant disabilities, some people would say. And fragile life uh, led to a lot of uncertainty, uh, he wasn't supposed to live for two days or two weeks or two years. And praise God, we just celebrated his 28th birthday. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, but he can't walk. He can't talk. Major seizure disorder, a lot of health care issues. But he's been a huge blessing in our life. And it was shortly after his birth, Josh, where I got recruited to lead an organization that served people with disabilities, uh, brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, kids with disabilities. And it was really in that space where I found out quickly, there's a lot of people advocating for education, right? Everybody wants to teach. Everybody wants to have the kids learn and have good instruction for the children. But there's very few people who are advocating on behalf of people with disabilities. And a lot of the people who have disabilities couldn't advocate for themselves. And so I found myself in a unique niche, uh, advocating for people with disabilities, how we can provide services that were philosophically right, and economically smart. And to the point where then Governor Branstad appointed me to chair a governor's council for him in you know, how we serve people with disabilities. And it was out of the service on that council where I thought, you know what? Iowa could use leadership from the outside, not from the inside. And that's what really prompted me to go all in. I ran for governor of the state of Iowa and that immersed me into politics and thus started my journey uh, in the political arena. I know you've written a book titled, I believe, Light from Lucas, um, just lessons from his life. And that, that's such a beautiful story in a culture that's so focused on me, you know, so focused on themselves um, to just uh, 
be able to share a remarkable testimony about how he's impacted your life. And so we'll link to that in the show notes if you're interested in, in picking that up. Well, Bob, I, I know that you are a very humble individual, but um, the Wall Street Journal, Fox News, and others have referenced you as the kingmaker. <laughs> um, I know you prefer a different designation, and that is standard bearer. But would you explain kind of those designations and how you're doing your best to steward the influence that God's given you? I know that's how you look at it um, for the advance of his kingdom. Yeah. Well, I think the reason, you know, some publications, whether it's Fox News or Wall Street Journal or plenty of others who picked up on the title Kingmaker was because in Iowa, we start off the presidential process, the presidential selection process. And especially when it comes to the Republican side, uh, all of them are trying to have access to our stage, now, whether it's the leadership summit mm -hmm. or they want to have access to our base. Our base is very influential here in the state of Iowa. And so I've endorsed uh, the past three caucus winners. And so I think they believe my endorsement carries all that weight and lifts up a Mike Huckabee or a Rick Santorum or a Ted Cruz. The fact is, uh, our base is very discerning. And I'd almost say that the base leads me to whom I endorse. And so uh, when they when they want to come to our stage, like on July 16th this year, I don't think so much about Bob Vanderplatz, but I think it's a whole lot about the Christians who are really interested in a biblical worldview, uh, who want to lead with the gospel, and they want to see its application in the administration of government. So I think that's who they want to get to. So what we say, as you mentioned, we'd rather be a standard bearer uh, and raise up God's word high uh, versus being a kingmaker. So I, I was laughing about a story of here you have these presidential hopefuls. You know, they're out kind of rubbing elbows with the elite. And then they come down home to, to Iowa and they kind of go into a, a truck stop diner. Uh, and in fact... Uh, my counterpart, Greg Baker, was sharing a story with me about a Democratic uh, presidential hopeful who grabbed a piece of pizza at Casey's. Uh, it's, Casey's is not a gas station. All right. So anybody listening, you need to get this correct if you have any future in politics. <laughs> all right. It is not a gas station. It's a pizza parlor, fine dining establishment. <laughs> I'm gonna say. But he picks up a piece of pizza and says, this was great breakfast pizza. But unfortunately, he had grabbed a piece of pizza that actually just had sausage on it. And it was not breakfast pizza, which I guess is a thing. Um, sure. and, and this was at least one reason why he did not reach the, <laughs> the presidency. But I just love the thought here we are in this participatory democracy where the people of Iowa, um, some people consider a flyover state, have a say in judging the character and fitness of a person for the office. So that was just kind of one fun story about what goes on there. You know, Josh, to build on that, um, a lot of people look at people running for president as all the notoriety, all the fame, you know, it's uh, private planes, it's all this jet set lifestyle. But the fact is, when you get to Iowa, it can be very humiliating. Uh, I was at an event with Donald Trump early on, and there wasn't 50 people in the room. And there was no rope lines, there was no, hey, it was just, they wanted to ask Donald Trump real questions. Uh, when Rudolph Giuliani ran for president, he had rope lines, he had black suburbans bring him in, all that stuff. And again, it was a town hall of about 80 people. And they're like, what's all this rope line stuff about? You know, so it, it does make them, Mike Huckabee, we were at the pizza ranch. And a guy came into the pizza ranch uh, banquet room there. And um, Mike Huckabee introduced himself. There's only like five of us there at the time. And Huckabee introduced himself as Mike Huckabee, and he was running for president. And the guy looked back at him and said, president of what? <laughs> so it, it, it can be very humiliating, but it does test your stamina, your perseverance. And I think it also tests your call to run for that office. I definitely think that's a healthy, healthy thing, <laughs> president of what? <laughs> yeah. That's great. So the family leader is a part of a, a network of policy organizations. Um, encouraged to begin or start by focus on the family back in approximately the 80s. Mm -hmm. And for those that might be unfamiliar, uh, will you kind of explain the history, the purpose of the movement? I see it as a critical piece in at least piece of the strategy in renewing the American experiment. So for those that are unfamiliar, could you explain that? Sure. Well, well Dr. Dobson, I think most of your listeners will understand 
Dr. Dobson, who was with Focus on the Family, founded Focus on the Family. He saw a lot of things that all of our focus was on the national level when it came to policy. And, and he thought, you know, we really need to be infiltrated in the state level when it comes to policies. Because what happens in the state of Washington doesn't stay in the state of Washington. Also, another state picks it up and another state picks it up. And pretty soon the federal, uh, the federal government's dealing with it. Yeah. So he thought, how about if we stop a lot of bad policy at the state level that would be against the family, that would be against justice, against righteousness? And let's advocate for really good policy at the state level that would uh, enhance families and be a blessing to righteousness and to, to justice. And so he started that about 30 years ago. And so that's where Indiana came on board, Iowa, the family leader came on board. And I believe now we have about 42 around the country uh, that are doing this. And initially, Josh, it was all on policy. Everything was focused on policy. So a lot of lawyers, uh, former legislators, they were involved in this movement. Well, then it got to be a point where we said, you know what? Policy is downstream from who you elect. If you elect the right person, they're going to advance the right policy. If you elect the wrong person, they're going to advance the wrong policy. So then a lot of our organizations, like the family leader, we got very involved in elections. And then surprisingly, every now and then, a candidate that we wanted to get elected got elected, and they still let us down. Hmm. They still went with policy that we thought, well, what are you doing? And so we learned, you know, that even elections are downstream from culture. And so if you get upset about, well, are these the best candidates we have? That's kind of looking culture in the mirror and it's a reflection of who we are. Hmm. So we said, we need to be about the business of cultural transformation. And cultural transformation can only happen through the power of the gospel. Hmm. And that's where we said, you know, so we need to lead with the gospel. We need to anchor in prayer because prayer will move mountains. And sometimes I think we say we should pray, but we don't pray. We really need to be founded in prayer. And then we need to authentically engage the bride of Christ in this process and reestablish its, its biblical role in the process versus hijacking the bride of Christ. And hijacking the bride of Christ would be, you know, every other year for an election, we, now we need the bride of Christ to come in. Or on a particular issue, we need the bride of Christ to come in. How about if we really teamed with the Bride of Christ, the church, in its mission, the Great Commission, and the ripple effect of that would be electing ministers of God, advancing righteous policy, and then having a biblical partnership between the church and government to meet community needs and to model the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Amen. So for the pastors that are listening um, that have heard me say something along the lines of, we don't want to run the Republican banner above the cross for six weeks, or if you're in certain churches, run the Democratic banner above the cross for six weeks. Now you've met Bob, who I think is the first one that used, or at least I've heard, use that, um, that saying. But I think it's so true it, as a description of sometimes how we've engaged in the past and trying to get the church involved in government. You know, Josh, we haven't said that, but uh, our actions have said it. Mm -hmm. That if we put this candidate's name above the cross, for six weeks, two months, everything's going to turn out okay. But if you, but if you don't, you know, and I think Jesus has got this covered. Nothing's taken him by surprise. So you've, you've hinted at it already, but what led you to rethink church engagement? Um, first in Iowa, but then really kind of around the FPC movement and led you to start church ambassador network. Well, what really, got me to rethink the church engagement piece is uh, I had a donor to my governor's campaign back in 2010, a major donor, great guy, great believer. And it was a very hard fought race. We lost by, it was a very close race, but we lost. And he said to me, he said, you know, until the church engages authentically, uh, he said, I just don't see any hope to elect candidates that truly would be a minister of God in that, in that venue, in that uh, vineyard.
back in 2011, 2012. Uh, we played politics, we played policy. And then 2012, uh, we, got a, um, we got a gut punch. Everything we back lost. Uh, Same-sex marriage was winning, marijuana was being, the referendums were passing on the, the marijuana usage. Just everything we did lost. And that's when I brought your counterpart, Greg Baker, into my office. And I said, unless we authentically engage the bride of Christ, uh, we might even win short term, but we're not going to win long term. And that's really what changed our posture on this. But it wasn't for political outcomes, even though immediately that, that might have been nice. But it was really about we need to we need to have cultural transformation. And there's only one thing that's going to do it. That's leading with the gospel. I've heard you frame this a, a couple of different times, but it didn't strike me until today uh, just how close that was. Uh, to have God calling me into this space. And I was, you know, engaging, uh, litigating First Amendment cases, feeling like I was kind of sticking my fingers in the holes in the dike and running out of available digits, you know. <laughs> and yeah. so that's important. But where's the transformation? Where's the long term strategy? Um, and had uh, Tony Perkins one time at a, a conference just look at me and say, Josh, you're a pastor. Where's the church? And it was kind of that same concept. And I've, that question has, has stuck with me. And, and that's what I've certainly been working on and grateful for your leadership from Iowa on that. And so how has this kind of new effort, all right, we're going to think about this differently. We're going to lead with the gospel. Uh, how has that impacted the state of Iowa? Well, I think it's changed everything. Uh, matter of fact, a key question, Josh, came up at our first leadership summit, which was 2012. And I, I often point back to that leadership summit now 10 years ago hmm. as being the defining leadership summit that changed our ministry. Hmm. But there was a Lutheran church pastor there by the name of Dr. Lawrence White. And in his remarks, he said, um, so is the church transforming culture or is culture transforming the church? Hmm. And you could have heard a pin drop because everybody knew that culture was having an outside hmm influence on the church versus the church having an outside influence on the culture. Mike Huckabee at that same conference said, unless we turn our hearts back to God, his principles, his precepts, it doesn't matter who we elect, this country will be game over. And it was Joel Rosenberg who basically said, it's revival or bust. Uh, we need a spiritual revival in this country, and we need to recognize it begins with me, my marriage, my family, my church, my community, but we have to look ourselves in the mirror. So that really, you know, had a fundamental impact on our ministry. But I would say since we have been doing what we refer to as the church ambassador network the right way, uh, bringing the shepherds of God's church to the shepherds of God's government, feeding into them as people, feeding into them as fellow shepherds, feeding into them as fellow partners, um, and you're building the relationship where they trust your heart. So therefore they'll hear your voice. And since we've been doing that, I, I would say if our policy team was on this call, they'd say we've had the best session probably ever this past session. And more righteous policies being discussed, not because it's Republican or Democrat, because it's right. Um, I think you're getting more and more elected office holders saying, I'm playing for an audience of one. I happen to lead this district or lead this state or lead whatever, but my real accountability is going to be to God. And so we're seeing a huge, I would say we're the, the spiritual temperature at the state capitol is at an all-time high. And again, I think it has changed everything uh, in our state. I was uh, looking at just a fantastic quote from Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds. She says, I personally witnessed the impact of the family leaders model in Iowa. Elections are impacted, best policies are enacted, and officials are blessed and encouraged when the church is authentically engaged. I cheer on this proven model, and I hope it is embraced and enacted in every state. So nothing like the chief executive of the state of Iowa putting a kind of rubber stamp on there. Uh, just a follow-up thought. As I've I'm talking to pastors, explaining this as one element of discipleship, that we're supposed to follow Jesus in every area of our lives, including in our role as citizen, 
especially in a participatory democracy. Um, this is not a kind of arm twisting, you know, manipulative strategy. It is bringing the word of God that's going to do the work in people's hearts. And then as we build those relationships, we expect that we're going to have conversations, not just about their own spiritual well-being, but also their role as an elected official. And you're, you're seeing that grow. We're seeing that uh, work here in the state of Indiana as well, now that we've done two sessions with this. Uh, so I'm just grateful that that's been so effective there. And now you're, you're kind of exporting that around the country. You call that national effort, the Daniel Impact. Um, so what's kind of the current reach of the Daniel Impact and kind of what's the next step level for that effort? But again, a very good question, Josh, because with the Daniel Impact, that was not really our idea. Uh, we were happy just to stay in Iowa, focus on Iowa. But it was actually donors to us hmm. who said, uh, this model needs to go to other states. It was actually elected officials uh, who had benefited from uh, our model here saying it needs to get to other states. It was presidential candidates saying the same thing, advisors to, to a president saying the same thing. And so we said, all right, uh, we'll pray about this. We prayed for 40 days as a team if we should even wow. think about going outside our borders. And the answer was very clear, yes. And so the reach right now is Ohio and Minnesota, Wisconsin, New Hampshire and Maine, your state, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Florida, uh, Arizona, Kansas, and Texas. And so there's 12 states engaging in this model. And I ask the question all the time when I get around the country to speak, what would it be like if the shepherds of God's church were having an intentional relationship with the shepherds of God's government, the Nathan to David? Yes, being concerned about them as individuals, as husbands and wives, as parents, their walk with the Lord, but also speaking into them as a fellow shepherd, not lobbying them, but what does God's word say about this? And so it's interesting, again, your counterpart, Greg Baker, will say, typically Democrats resonate real quickly with the God of mercy. They have a harder time with the God of justice. But so we use the God of mercy, and then we introduce the God of justice. Republicans all are all too familiar with the God of justice, and they like the God of justice. Well, a little bit more uncomfortable with the God of mercy. So we talk about the God of justice, but then we introduce the God of mercy. And so, again, it's up to that shepherd of God's government to make the final determination on the vote. But at least we can present God's word in its truest form to that shepherd. And I think what, what is the final element of it, though, that I think is the culminating element, is when the shepherds of God's government and the shepherds of God's church come together to be partners, to really be the hands and feet, to break bondage. And when that happens, again, I think trust goes through the roof. And if trust goes through the roof, also the words you speak are going to be heard. So this is a, a follow-up question that I, I didn't quite tee up beforehand, but I, I think you'll have a, a good answer for us. He, something that I keep getting from pastors is we say we're nonpartisan. Sure. Right. So we're going to focus on the gospel first, but you're, you're also, even as you stated in, in the interview, um, heavily invested in Republican politics. And I, I have had um, a gentleman, Justin Gibbity on the podcast, who's pretty heavily invested in the Democratic Party. And so for Christians that want to engage in politics, but don't want to put their identity mm -hmm. as a member of a party above that of being a Christian, what are some practical ways that you navigate that? And how would you encourage church leaders to encourage their people to do that well? Well, I think what you just said, because um, I think we do, we have an identity crisis in this country. Mm -hmm. And that identity could be my party comes first. Uh, my sexuality comes first, uh, my job comes first, my title comes first, my position comes first. And when in the Ten Commandments, if we go all the way back to Exodus, that whole deal about don't have any other gods, you know, besides me, that's your identity. 
and the identities in Christ. So let's keep that first and foremost. And I think when you're living that out, then whether you're a lawmaker or you're a candidate or you're a business owner or you're a mom or a dad is always check your heart. Why am I doing what, I, what I'm doing? Is it just about winning or is it about to further the gospel? Is my testimony going to be disqualified or compromised if I go down this path? Because there's a lot of things that might feel good in the moment, but it would disqualify or compromise your testimony. And yeah, that's a unique, that's a unique space in which we occupy. You guys in Indiana, us and I, it's a unique space. But it's one that if it's threaded well, is so, so needed in this culture. Amen to that. And I appreciate your example. I know that many pastors are wrestling with how do I do that <laughs> in this current political moment? And some of it comes down to, I think, rejecting the false choice in that culture is going to tell us one or the other, man, that's all yeah. you can do. Um, and as Christians, we say, no, our allegiance is in heaven, but we're going to be good citizens here. So I've expressed this to you a few times, but I did want to just say thanks on this uh, interview. About two years ago, um, as I came on the team here in Indiana, I, I was getting, I don't know that desperate, maybe discouraged uh, is the right word, in that I've strong call to spread the gospel, defend religious liberty, renew the American experiment. But I, again, that kind of rear guard action, I just didn't feel like that's, that's not the gospel. I mean, the gates of hell don't prevail against the church. Culture is changing quickly, and I'm looking to leaders at the national stage. And it's not a knock on anyone. We're all trying to navigate this. Okay. But I was able to attend a dinner where you explained a kind of gospel-centered, uh, church-led, state-focused strategy uh, for renewing the American experiment. And it really encouraged my heart um, and just kind of gave me, okay, we, here's the strategy. We can go work on it. So would you share that with uh, the pastors that are listening, others that are listening? Some thoughts as we look down the road. Well, first of all, Josh, thank you for saying you're, you're encouraged because I'm encouraged by it as well. And the reason I say that is if my hope was in the next Republican victory or in the next flawed candidate win, I don't know if I could occupy this space much longer. Uh, just because I know there's, we have to, we have to, as you hear me say a lot, we have to look higher. You know, our help comes from the Lord. We need to think bigger than just a political victory. And we need to expect more out of this. I mean, God said, you know, I'm going to, Christ, I'm going to come and bring life and bring an abundant life. You know, so expect more of the John 10, 10. And so what I've heard from my peers through the Daniel Impact is how this has given them such confidence, encouragement, when they put their head in the pillow at night, they feel good because they're advancing the kingdom, that they're being light into a dark place many times. And if you don't compromise that light, we should all feel good about that. Now, there's times we think, oh, I wish we would have won that or, you know, I wish we didn't have to experience that. But if you keep the main thing, the main thing, which in our case as Christians is the gospel, and we understand that this is God's design the institution of the church, the institution of government, the institution of the family, that all of them are meant to work together, not to just to bring God honor, which it is, but also to bless families and to bless a nation as well. And so two things that I've, I've kind of caught from hearing you speak, one being just a confidence that God's still control. We can still move confidently to put these institutions back together in the way that God designed them, but then also just abundance um, to, to say, Hey, I'm going to look sad outside the borders of Iowa when you still have the responsibility of leading an organization in your own state and to say that God's bigger and he's got bigger plans and, and bigger dreams. And that is so contrary to the temptation of kind of let's shutter the windows, chain the doors because the, <laughs> the storm's coming, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that gets some clicks, you know, that, that gets eyeballs, but I don't think that's how God intends for us to live. So I appreciate your example in that. You, you had a remarkable relationship, uh, with someone named Donna Redwing, And I, I love the story. And I think it's such a, a great example uh, for church leaders, especially those that are involved in the public squares. So would you share that story? You know, I, I will, Josh. And um, I, I, let me comment first on what you said this about 
a God of abundance and walking in confidence is that, you know, Jesus said, Matthew 9, 38, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So crowd to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers. And that's really where we're at with the Daniel impact. And it's about leading with an open hand. It's too many times, even in ministry, we get competitive. This is mine, or this is yours, or that's my donor. That's your donor. You know, instead of how about if we just operate in unity in the spirit of John 17 unity, and let's lead with an open hand and make everybody better in the process, including making us better. Cause we learn from Indiana. We learn from Florida. We learn from these other States that we're involved in as well as hopefully they learn something from us. And some of that may be not what not to do and what to do. So therefore I think we should trust God, trust his word. He is a God of abundance and the harvest is plentiful. So why don't, why don't we just synergize the laborers in the process? To your point about Donna Redwing, um, uh, I did not see this one coming. Uh, Donna Redwing leads the state of Iowa's largest LGBT organization. Um, and although I had never met her, I saw her name uh, in articles in the press. And alongside of my name and articles in the press, I was always taking the opposing view. She was doing that. Yeah. And unbeknownst to me, she came to a leadership summit. Hmm. And at lunchtime, I'm walking around and I'm greeting people and working the crowd, so to speak. And out of 2000 people, she came up to me. She introduced herself as Donna Redwing. And I thought, that's really cool that she's at our summit. Yeah. And she goes, I know you need to see a lot of people. So I just want to ask you this one thing and then I'll leave. And that is, will you commit to do coffee with me? Hmm. And I said, yeah, you know, and just moved on. Kind of like, sure, I will. Kind of like I got rid of her. Now I'm on to the next <laughs> one. Never thinking she'd follow up on it. And she followed up by emailing her staff and saying, hey, Bob agreed to do coffee. I need a good time and date and let's meet. And my staff was kind of floored that Donna Red Wings invited me to coffee. And so we went and we had uh, our first coffee together several years ago. And I found out quickly, she did not really have an agenda. She really wanted to get to know who I was, uh, which made me think I shouldn't have an agenda, but I should get to want to know who she is. And so then over the course of years, we developed a really deep relationship. Uh, Troy told many audiences, I would do just about anything for Donna. I'd take a bullet for Donna. Where Donna would say, even though I disagree with much of what Bob says, she said, I'd fight to my final breath that he has the opportunity to say it. And so we were really kind of a model, uh, at least in our areas, of how can you have deep, deep, deep disagreement and still have civil dialogue? And we ended up being obviously very, very good friends to the point where a couple of years ago, she developed stage four cancer. Uh, she reached out to me and needed prayer uh, and asked me for prayer. Uh, so not only did I say I'd pray for her, but Darla and I went to the hospital and Darla's my wife, went to the hospital and we prayed with Donna. We prayed with her partner, Sumitra. We held hands. Uh, around Donna's bedside with Donna. And long story short, you know, uh, it was several months after that, that Donna passed away. And I genuinely love Donna. Uh, I miss her. And after she passed away, Samitra gave me a call and asked if I would give the eulogy at her funeral, wow. uh, which was at the Universal Unitarian Church, the Universalist Unitarian Church. And the place was packed with people that knew me or knew of me, but they were not supporters of mine. And yet, Samitra had me sit with the family, Darla and I with the family. I was able to give the eulogy, I was able to communicate the gospel, and at the heart of the gospel's reconciliation. You know, the only reason I could love Donna or anybody else is because of God reconciled me to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And 
asked everybody to honor the legacy of Donna by inviting somebody out to coffee who they really, really disagree with. And the reason is I really believe a lot of gospel conversions are going to happen through coffee conversations. And after the funeral, we had a lineup, Darla and I had a lineup of people who wanted to see us. Many of them were crying just because we were there. And so it was another way of just saying, you can thread a needle of leading with the gospel and not compromising the truth of the scriptures, okay? But truly loving one another in the process. I mean, that, that is such a beautiful story. And I find it interesting that she, she led with that, that she actually reached out uh, to you. And, and certainly at least the lesson is to begin reaching back out. I think of, of one particular legislator um, that we've been building a relationship with here completely ideologically opposed, but uh, towards the end of session kind of came over and gave me a fist bump. And so we hope to continue building those again, not twisting anyone's arm, not manipulating anybody, but just saying, Hey, we love you as Christ loved us. And I suppose there are some that will, will not engage in those types of conversations, but there are a number of people that still will. Uh, so I, I just think it's such a great example for us. We'll link to the TFL website where you can see more about that story. I just thought it was such an excellent example. Bob, any recent kind of meaningful moments? Uh, you just shared a remark remarkable one, but uh, just meaningful moments, times that you sense God kind of working in your, your ministry, your family? You know, one that was very, very visible to us. Uh, and, it, and again, most of the good stuff that happens in our ministry, I usually say no to first, and then we do it, and then it turns out to be great. Uh, but my wife, Darla, and I were in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Darla got a call and asked if, um, if the family leader could lead the National Day of Prayer uh, in the state of Iowa and Iowa's capital this year because somebody got sick or whatever it was that said, would the family leader take the lead on it? Hmm. And so Darla asked me and I said, no, we're not doing that. And I said, we have enough events. The session's busy. We got a lot on our plate. I don't need another event to do. And then Darla said to me in a very soft voice, but uh, you know, kind of pulling the trump card on me saying, I think we're supposed to do it. Hmm. Oh boy. <laughs> And I said, all right, we'll do it. And I said, uh, but if we're going to do it, we're going to do it with excellence. And in the rotunda at the Iowa Capitol, which is a beautiful capital, one of the most beautiful capitals in the country, praise and worship, hundreds of people attended. And the name of Jesus was high and lifted up. But what was really cool, Josh, is both sides of the aisle were represented. Hmm. We had diversity from all across the state. We had Governor Kim Reynolds, Republican, leading in prayer as governor of the state of Iowa. We had our Attorney General, Tom Miller, the longest serving Democrat, leading in prayer, participating in worship. And it really blew us away about the power of the Holy Spirit in that place. Where we were getting text messages from people who were in committee hearings texting our team saying, we don't know what's going on in the rotunda, but keep it up. This is awesome. <laughs> they could hear the praise. They could hear the worship. And then we just found out uh, last week that uh, a legislator gave his life to Christ oh, because okay. of that event. Wow. Amen. And so it was a deal about, you know, when we really do this, uh, infuse government with the gospel. Government's a major, major sector of our society. We don't want to leave the gospel outside of it. Mm -hmm. and if you, you know, good things are going to happen. And so we saw the name of Jesus high and lifted up. We saw God honored. We saw people blessed. And it, it was one of the most remarkable things I've seen in a long time. Wow, that's an amazing story. And having a legislator come to Christ, that yeah. sometimes it just the, the lesson is listen to your wife. I guess <laughs> <laughs> when Darla says, Hey, we need, to Darla. <laughs> when yeah. you need to do this, do it. Yeah. Um, so, while we come to a close, I want to ask you a fairly open ended question here about you, you've been a teacher, you've been working for with church leaders for a long time, your leader, political space. Um, you've shared kind of a vision for the church. Would you speak to a pastor 
that's trying to manage a congregation has come through 2020. <laughs> COVID, masks, shutdowns, political division, uh, racial issues, trying to navigate all of that. Um, how, how would you speak to him and, get, and encourage him to lead his church well in this particular area? Yes, yeah, sir. Great question, Josh. And first of all, I have the utmost respect for pastors uh, who God calls to fill his pulpits, to fill, to fill his church, to, to be a shepherd to the flock. It's an awesome responsibility. And I probably would remind pastors the same thing I remind others many times. And especially in those times of discouragement, where you think, am I having an impact? Am I making a difference? Uh, Psalm 121 says, I, I look to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Find our strength in the Lord. So we say, look higher. The whole think bigger deal. I, I love, I've always been encouraged by the conversation between Jesus and Peter. Right after Jesus tells, or right after Peter confesses who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah. And Jesus says, well, that didn't come from you. You know, and upon this rock, I'll build my church, right? Well, Jesus tells about his, his suffering, his upcoming crucifixion, all that stuff. And Peter says, no, 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 that's not going to happen. We got a good thing going on. And why? Because we're going to take over Rome. And Jesus, not in these words, but basically said, think bigger, Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan. You know, don't let this world be our focus. Let the eternal be our focus. And the other part about expect more. Uh, plug into the God of abundance. It's not prosperity gospel, but our, our God is a God of abundance and put our hope and trust in him. I have great, great hope for the bride of Christ. I believe when Jesus said upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's an offensive statement. I believe he meant it. And I believe it's the one vehicle that Jesus left to us to confront the spiritual forces which we face that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6. Amen. Well, I may have um, referenced it, or you may have referenced it already, but if you had that billboard on which you could put a message to the church, <laughs> it might be the same thing, but uh, what would you put on that? Yeah, you know, if it's a message to the church, um, I think it's so easy for us, especially today, uh, where we're conditioned to get into tribal camps. Uh, we're either for this or we're against this. We either watch Fox News or we watch CNN. Um, it, it's, I mean, my neighbor puts up a sign that I never would put up. That means they don't want to talk to me. Uh, you know, we build in our narratives that we want to hear. And it makes us isolationist. And it makes us, you know, we're, we're not reaching any, but we're just reaching our own tribe. And that's where I think it's a whole deal about look higher. You know, and, and maybe it's look higher and have some fun already. Because when you do that, I think it releases us. Um, I've had so many people, Josh, who have told me uh, who have either been addicted to CNN or addicted to Newsmax or addicted to Fox or addicted to some podcast where they said, you know, I've, I've unplugged. I, I've unplugged for so many weeks or whatever. And you can't believe the difference in me. Because if you just keep feeding yourself with that stuff, it, I, I don't know where the hope is, but that's why God's word is filled with hope. Jesus is the hope of the world. Let's plug into him and let's say their stuff, get behind me, Satan. Uh, I'm walking with Christ here. Amen. Well, I'm into that. Bob, thanks so much for taking some time with us. We appreciate your leadership and your vision. Um, I'm grateful to know you. And like I said, you've been a great personal encouragement to me just seeing a leader on the national stage kind of set out this gospel-centered vision for where we go next. So thank you for opportunity to, to talk with you today. Look forward to hearing more about what's coming out of the great state of Iowa. Well, Josh, thank you so much for having me on. And you're a great encouragement. You, along with Ryan and your team at, at Indiana Family Institute, and remind your viewers to come to the Leadership Summit, July 16th. Be encouraged. Uh, and they can find that at thefamilyleader.com as well. And yeah, so we'll link that. I'm actually looking forward to being there as well and, and seeing you and the rest of the team, a number of great speakers. So we'll, we'll link that. So thanks again, Bob. All right. God bless, Josh.